Hello, my name is Ted Arani, and I want to share a presentation with you that I gave at the annual World Operational Excellence in Business Transformation Summit in Orlando this past October. It was a great opportunity to start the discussion on two topics that I'm passionate about, business value and AI. Specifically, how do we build a practical and quantifiable business case for an AI program? This is an approach that I've refined to call it the parameters that we can plan for and the results that we can measure on a working level. And from these two items, how do you quantify the value that your AI program can deliver today? I assume if you're watching this that you might be someone in your organization that's asked to build business cases from time to time. Maybe you've been asked to do one for an AI program and are wondering where to start. The exercise might seem hard because of the unpredictable results of AI programs. But why is that? Um, why is this a new challenge in the business world? I'm personally convinced that there's nothing unique about AI systems such that we can't apply traditional business case practices to solve them. Um, it's just that the measurement and parameters are a little different and unpredictable. There's a technical term for that unpredictability, and that is non-determinism. I like this simple definition by the great computer scientist Robert Floyd. So since saying business critical systems that we get to deliver as practitioners that deliver different outputs, different results, even when run with the exact same input. A great time to be alive, right? I guess unless you're in quality assurance. Um, but don't worry, this isn't a talk about the technical parameters of AI. This is purely a financial performance review. So how we're going to do that is I'm going to start with a straightforward AI powered business solution. We'll apply traditional business case best practices to this model, including cataloging the business architecture. We're going to score it for business performance with a heat map. Um, we'll do some traditional BPMN process modeling, and then we're going to run some, some live simulations where work, cycle time, um, cost per transaction, financial performance are going to come out um, of that program. This approach works for all digital transformation initiatives, not just AI. The challenge we have now with AI programs, though, is that the swing in business outcomes is just significant. That's all. So um, let's get started. So we're going to build a simple process model with AI at its core. This is actually a program that I have some experience with. About two years ago, I was asked to lead the due diligence and then subsequent acquisition of an AI-based managed services uh, company. The program was pretty exciting. Um, at its core were um, an AI engine and a business process in a space called IDP, which stands for Intelligent Document Processing. There's a impressive customer base, um, a pretty good working technical solution, um, just some challenges in the uh, business parameters of the program. And here's how this system works. As input, um, as an IDP program, um, you get uh, documents into the business, lots of them. These are fed into an AI engine. Uh, this is a commercial AI engine that has a couple jobs. It has to do some data extraction, some field extraction, some calculation on those fields, some collation of the data, just generally doing some basic processing of digital data and documents. Those documents are either completed 100% and sent through to an end state, what we'll call SDP or straight through processing. If there um, are any parameters that can't be processed by the AI engine, uh, either partially or completely, they're passed down to a worker there in the blue sweater. That is called human in the loop. And that staff had two jobs. They were to manually process all of the parameters and capabilities of these documents that AI wasn't able to. Uh, and they also had a second job, which was to provide training feedback. This is a reinforced learning model where as the workers work the manual work, AI gets uh, instruction on how to maybe identify that unique case next time and, and properly uh, handle it. That's it. This is our uh, business uh, front to back. Um, there's a learning cycle here on data. This is a pre-trained AI engine, pre-trained for this type of document processing. But then there's another six month kind of on the job feedback cycle with a certain customer's data set to run this program. Again, AI at its core. So let's apply some of the financials to this program and see what that looks like. First, there's a charge, 35 cents a document for uh, this program as they come in. This is a commercial charge under contract by the customers to the program. That's our revenue source. 
We have a charge of seven cents per document because this is a commercial AI engine that's going to operate on a transactional basis. So each document that comes through, we have to pay for. It's important to note that 100% of the documents that go through, we have to pay for, whether they are processed by the engine or not, completely or partially. Uh, and then the worker has a cost, contract labor force at $18 an hour. That gives you a capacity of roughly two documents um, or a document every two minutes rather. That's about 60 cents a document in charge. Um, the other parameter here is we've got a 92% STP rate. So 90 of every 100 documents come through, about eight need some manual intervention or human processing. So what does financial model look like for this? Um, it's actually pretty good, right? We've got a pretty profitable model at very low volumes and it grows linearly up to the right. You have one little dip uh, there, do you see? That's basically when you reach capacity for the human in the loop. In this case, about 750,000 documents per year is the workload that one human in the loop can handle the fallout. Again, the 8% error correction for. Outside of that, this program just grows linearly. So this is a pretty good working business model, right? I mean, let's just all go buy a bunch of AI and get to business and, and not worry about it. Well, you know, promised a business case review, a financial review, where we're going to build back up some of the challenges in, in a model. So we need something that has some challenges. Um, it just so happens I've got a disaster of a program for us to take a look at. We're going to use that and see how we build it back up. And here it is. Um, you're like, wait, what's going on? This is the exact same model. Well, actually, what I just showed was the end state after we applied some financial correction measures to the key elements that were hurting the business case. That was a final state we could reach. It actually started out much different. It started in a poor performing financial AI program. Uh, let me detail out why. First, um, for a revenue charge, we actually have 42 cents a document. And this was a pricing threshold set for no other reason that this was the highest revenue target we could set commercially and still be competitive in the market. Uh, and so we did, we picked the, the largest price point um, for this program when we started. There was a commercial AI platform that was on a different licensing mechanical model. It was actually a $200,000 a year, all in upfront license model. Now that gave you unlimited capacity. There's actually technically a limit to the capacity, but it's so far off the right-hand side of our um, scale that we didn't think we'd run up into it, certainly within the, the one-year annual subscription um, period that we had. Uh, our worker cost was the same at $18 an hour, pretty stable financial model for manual labor. Um, but then there's one other parameter in here that, that had an impact and that's the STP rate. You see here, the program actually started at 65% STP rate. This is actually a post-training rate after six months of reinforced learning with a commercial AI engine pre-trained in the IDP space, we're still only able to get 65 percent where we bonked out we actually started at 60 percent and that six months of training got us five percentage points that's it um we we knew we'd make some progress we hoped it would be more so what does that financial model look like it's actually pretty disastrous right we've got a loss of revenue we've got an unprofitable business at low volume it doesn't get much better at high volumes um, you still have the lumpiness from the additional workers, but at that 65% STP rate, you need a lot more workers in order to get through um, the workload. You need to hire them on quicker. So this is a pretty unprofitable business model, one that needs correction. Um, that's right. I said we're going to fix it. Let's talk about how we fix it. And so I recommend the first step is just really get a, a good baseline of where you're at. And, and I use business architecture to do that. What I built on the right here is a business architecture specification, not for an entire organization, which is what you would typically do. I've stayed nearer within the operations window. That's where this whole program operates. Uh, you've got high level category of capabilities. This is a business capability readout. You've got document intake on the left, nice green. This is a heat map of financial performance. Then you've got um, IDP document processing. This is your AI powered um, uh, capability within the program. The next box at the high level is <clears throat> manual document processing. This is your human in the loop. And then finally you got document output, which uh, generally performs well. It's so a couple other things that we've mapped out and, and modeled within this business architecture. You see this little 
light bulb icon under the IDP, these are opportunities, ideas for financial improvement that we have that aren't necessarily adding capabilities, but just ways that we can make this business model better. And then we see a couple of icons that are process diagrams. These imply of these different business capabilities, we either have a process model built or we see benefit in building a process model that give us clarity on how these operate and where we can make improvements. At the lower level, we're gonna take a look at some areas of poor financial performance. We've got some challenges with document quality. Um, we also have um, an even low rate of poor performance with our STP rate for an AI. We see how damaging that can be to our business case. So we're gonna identify that as an area for improvement. We're gonna look at our processing capacity for the human in the loop. If we're able to do more than a document every two minutes, or if we're able to use technology training uh, some other area to give more capacity to those humans in the loop, that would give us a better business performance. We know that. And then finally, the training impact of AI. Are we able to use each of those reinforced learning feedback cycles to make our STP rate go up, to make the AI engine work better for us, get more straight through? Um, so those are some areas that we'll look at. Um, I also talked about opportunities, and there are two real um, significant opportunities for business performance improvement. And that is the overall cost of the AI license, which is one of the big blocks within our financial model, and then the license mechanics and how we're actually gonna have to pay for, be charged for AI enabled in our solution. So let's look at um, some specifics. Uh, first, to improve our STP rate, and our, um, we had a challenge with document quality. So what you see here is a newspaper article, um, uh, just a generic one. The interesting thing about newspapers is in print, they're generally 150 DPI or less. Turns out this was a lower threshold in which our AI could even understand or process documents. So while you and I can read that newspaper article just fine, we've been able to for hundreds of years, uh, AI finds this to be too low resolution. We knew there was a lower bound on the threshold. We didn't know where it was. And so we've got some fallout, some STP failures due to low resolution documents. You also see some handwriting on the left. Handwriting was a challenge. That's my handwriting written there. I'm handwriting challenged, but you, us as humans can read that and understand it generally. Our AI could handle about 5% of handwriting samples that came through in these documents. So in both cases, these were um, a lower uh, volume threshold than uh, the majority of the documents, but not insignificant. And either uh, a handwritten document or a low resolution document could pose challenges to our STP, which also pose challenges to our uh, business case. So how do we remediate that? There's sort of three steps. You can isolate, quantify, and allocate. By that, I mean, one, we need to isolate the data that is contributing to our poor business performance. In this case, low quality scans and handwriting. We need to quantify exactly how many documents fit this category now, how many documents fit the category going forward, um, and then quantify the financial impact of having those. And then we need a financial allocation strategy to alleviate any cost burden from that. In this case, um, we eventually deployed new technology that was better with handwriting and low resolution documents. But in the meantime, while we were operating under contract, we had the opportunity to charge different rates for certain documents. And so we did remediate through a higher financial parameter, just we charge a higher contract rate to the end customer for any documents below a certain resolution threshold or documents with handwriting knowing they're gonna go 100% to the human in the loop without um, our ability to overcome those through training. Um, let's also talk about training impact because that had a performance impact on our financial model. Um, what we see here are two addresses. We look at those and generally know they are the exact same address, but to the AI system, these were two unique and distinct addresses. In fact, the one on the left, it could read and understand and process correctly. The one on the right, it was unable to, even with reinforced learning and training. It turned out that break line between building and 47B, you and I read that and we, our brains can process and put those two together. It's a concept we can understand. For AI, it was a concept that it absolutely could not understand, nor was it able to be trained or learned through. So we need a remediation strategy for certain data elements that are falling out like this 
items that should be teachable that aren't. In this case, we deployed new learning technology that was better capable of specifically addresses. Turns out addresses are a data element that AI can be better trained for or not, um, which is surprising. We just weren't aware that addresses would be any more challenging than the rest of data. Um, address processing is not a new challenge. The United States Postal Service has been using AI for address recognition for decades, but the particular technology that we had that we started with um, had some challenges around um, addresses. And then second, we were able to remediate this using uh, traditional technology, basically by identifying streams of cases that were unprocessable by uh, AI, nor were they teachable, use traditional scripting to identify those cases through, um, um, through detection, and then apply basic scripting, traditional coding technolo technologies to fix or align those data records so that they would be handled and processed by AI and push them through, basically using legacy technology to get a better output from um, an AI and its limitations. And finally, I talked about two opportunities that we wanted to work on, um, in this case, a license cost and license mechanics. I have here a graph basically representing both the original license model or fixed rate $200,000 license cost and how that impacts the volume, of course, off to the right, and then the secondary um, license mechanics that we were able to identify with a per document volume-based charge system at seven cents. Now, these are two very real commercial offers. I haven't named what they are, um, and I won't be naming what they are. Um, this data is two years old. Both these products still exist in the market and have different license mechanics and pricing. What is common today, and I think will be common going forward as well, is that in the market there are a variety of different license uh, mechanics that you can engage in for commercial AI, and there are a wide range of prices overall, all in that you can pay for AI independent of the license mechanics, and these have, of course, a big impact on the overall business case. Um, but here there is one differential. Uh, the all-in license was generally unlimited volume. You know, the volume limit is far off to the right, whereas a transaction model, um, obviously, you pay more for higher volumes. So on surface and in planning, it might look like, well, these two are equivalent at a certain volume range off to the right. Um, why not just consider them equivalent for a $3 million projection? Well, the reality is in order to get to that volume with the STP rates we had, you need 17 humans in the loop at the point in which these two license models are equivalent. That was a scale, uh, a growth trajectory for the program that we just were far away from. Um, and hiring 17 people to do the manual fallout just really opens up a whole different business, a whole different uh, dynamic and parameter far out of the range of where we're operating. Really for us, the, the bigger impact is in that white space off to the left. And so you know, then for remediation, why not just um, negotiate a better license price? Well, if you argue you could negotiate maybe on a, a traditional license model with 10% discount, what does that look like? Well, yeah, that does obviously help the business case for the traditional model. If you have a volume-based discount of you know 5% and a million and 10% and 2 million, that also helps the, the second license model, but it doesn't really change the calculus at all, right? Really what you see is a lot of white space on the left, which is the business um, impact of the traditional license model. And in fact, the inflection line where these two are equivalent is still in the same spot and volume off to the right. And so that white space was uh, a challenge for the program for a number of reasons. The biggest one was because of the variability in the business. You see, we had new customers sign or customers not renew their contract. Even within each of those customers, the volumes could expand and contract seasonally or on other schedules. Uh, the data came in daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and so there was variability in the volumes everywhere to the left where there is white space as the business grew and shrank over time. The fixed license costs had a hindrance on every one of those transactions. That white space there, um, it's hard to quantify exactly how much of a business impact it had because the volumes moved up to down, but certainly getting a predictable cost output aligned to the revenue coming in made us all sleep better at night. So that was key. So the remediation we talked about was negotiating an overall license 
cost at a lower price point with the infrastructure, but more importantly, aligning a different license mechanic and model, which we were able to with a equivalently performing technical solution actually performed a little bit better, a license mechanic that aligned the cost to our revenue side. All right, so to recap where we are, we have you know, identified our business model with its financial challenges. We've articulated all the different areas of business capability that this program offers, but then applied a heat map of financial performance or specifically a lack of financial performance in some of those key capability areas. Um, we've also done some remediation. We either have plans to make changes or have made changes to the program that we know are going to have an impact on our financial performance. So all of that has built a great catalog of things to change and improve and things to do, but we've yet been able to quantify any of those. We won't have enough money or time to do all of those things, most likely. So we need to understand the financial impact of each and every one of those changes. So the answer to that lies in process modeling. So here we built a traditional BPMN process model that's the equivalent functional um, case of the, the that high level model that I started us off with. We've got a swim lane for the AI. We have a swim lane for human in the loop. The system is there for document input and output. And then we've got a decision gateway. That decision gateway is simply the STP rate, the percentage that flows straight through by the AI's complete and accurate processing and those that need to drop to the human in the loop. So with this process model, we're actually able to add structured data to it. We can add structured data around the work time, cycle time, transaction cost, that's why it's important to have a BPMN model, something a little bit more than the picture. The picture tells us who does what, but BPMN or a structure like that gives you quantifiable data values that allow you to do some real impact analysis. So let's do that. We're going to run some simulations here. I'm going to start us with simulating the baseline. By that, I mean I've loaded in the key parameters of our baseline business case. Our worker has a cost that's been loaded in. Our AI engine has a traditional license model all in at $200,000 for our unlimited capacity. We've got a decision gateway with our STP rate at 65%, which is note where we know we bunked out with our engine. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to load 1,200 documents. That's about a 2x workload for the program or the system uh, with one human in the loop worker. We're going to have that worker run. Um, through a standard business working days of eight hours, but we're going to have the volume come in over a 24 hour period. So let's run that simulation and watch and see what happens. A couple things um, are illustrated through a simulation. We've got these buckets. This is our work queue dynamically growing and shrinking. Um, we see a heat map. The boxes change color. Obviously, as you'd expect, the worker is putting in the much more work than the AI engine, which operates fairly quickly. And then it's completed. And the first thing that we see out of simulation is a work backlog. We've got a work backlog of 325 documents. That's over 10 hours of backlog of worker time for that one human in the loop. Um, obviously untenable for one business day. So the first thing we see out of simulation is work and work backlog. Let's look at the second parameter. This is work time. Uh, as we expected, it took longer than a business day. In fact, it took two full business days to work through this 1200 document workload. The AI is fairly unutilized at 20 minutes of processing time. Um, and uh, we didn't make it in one business day. It took about two. So let's look at the financial output of the simulation and we've done run calculations of cost. The AI engine for processing itself basically took two days of, of off the factory floor for our AI engine to get through this workload because it needs the workers um, aligned to it to continue processing through. That equates to over $1,000 of AI engine cost. Two work days for our contract labor force equates to about $264 for an all-in cost of $1,344 for 1,200 documents. Translates to you know, buck 12 per of expense per document and our 42 cent revenue model. This is obviously um, a money loser. We're losing 70 cents on every one of these documents we run through. Simulation now shows us in real parameters, real, real output, the financial and, and, and labor cost of this program. Well, let's do the same thing now with the corrections. Uh, let's apply all the fixes that we know or all the changes we think we can impact 
We've now changed the AI license mechanics to be a transaction-based cost at seven cents a document. We're going to um, align to our better, newer engine with other parameters that get us 92% STP rates. We set our decision gateway that way. Human labor cost is the same. This time, we're still going to apply one human in the loop over a 24-hour window with one business working day, but we're going to overload it with uh, four and a half times our workload at 2,800 documents and see what our capacity is now with these changes. I hit start on the simulation. Again, a work queue is filling up. The manual processing is the heat map lit uh, process step, as you'd expect. And now we're complete. We ran through a fewer uh, number of documents went the south route through the human in the loop, of course. And we have a max work queue of 116. That's less than four working hours of work backlog for a human in the loop. That's pretty manageable. Go to lunch, come back, have a workload that you can clear through in the afternoon. Let's look at our work parameter. Perfect. We made it in a business day, actually less than a business day, to get through this 2800 document workload. So that aligns. We're actually making the AI engine work more. We're balancing out the load um, because of the number of documents that it can process within a, a calendar day. And then on the cost side, much better cost numbers here for less than $200. We've aligned our AI engine uh, of value to the work through. Uh, and the labor costs are significantly less, of course, for the human in the loop because they're able to work it in less than a working day. Now, this looks like a very profitable program. We're making a dollar in margin um, almost on every four documents that are run through, even at a lower revenue rate of 35 cents a document because our expense are only 12 cents per overall. So here we've seen simulation has shown us both all the negative impacts around some of those parameters in real quantifiable metrics around work time and cost in the earlier scenario. And then we see those changes. I think you can visualize how you could change any number of parameters and understand how that would impact the work day, the cycle time, and the financial parameters. Say we increase the number of workers, we increase the STP rate, we change any financial parameter around the worker cost or the AI engine, we can see exactly in real parameters how that would uh, impact the business. It's a fantastic insight that we have. So to, um, to close out, I want to walk through a number of um, learnings, lesson learns that you know, me and the team um, discovered, mostly pitfalls that we found through stepping into them through the program. Uh, that, that maybe can guide you if any of these program parameters creep into your discussions around business cases for AI or otherwise. And within AI programs, these specific findings include, you know, one, don't factor in anything but the release that you have in hand today. You'll hear a lot of talk um, in, in lab work around what's capable uh, from AI programs, what's the possible outcomes that we can get here in the media where AI is going or where we expect it to take us. But at the end of the day, there's only one working AI engine model that you can factor, and that's the one that you have in lab in your hands at that moment. So use the capabilities that you can see, the training impact that you can achieve through each of um, the, the parameters that make sense for your business case to, to judge whether you've got a working solution, both financially and technically. Uh, next, if you're going to plan a training curve, you really need to understand where it starts and where it finishes. You need to map it and you need to test it more than just skip lot testing. You know, we saw with six months of reinforced learning on all of our production data, the latest AI engine only able to improve our STP rate 5% through that um, for that particular engine before it bogged out. Um, we just didn't know where we would get until we ran through enough production data. Similarly, we were able to rerun all of that production data through other technical solutions to get back to our post state of a learning number and found one that gave us 92% STP, made a significant impact on it. So, but you've got to put in the work, you've got to run the data through, not just plan or predict based on what you've been told an AI engine can do. Um, next, we haven't really talked much about performance, but performance is a parameter to understand and be aware of. Um, I'm guilty, I know, in traditional technologies of just assuming performance is not a problem. If it's a commercial SaaS platform, if you have performance issues, you call up the vendor and you make it their problem. 
If it's an on-prem traditional technology deployment, you just call up a DBA and have them work their magic, they make it more performant. AI systems are a bit less predictable in their response time, their performance needs and their output. In our case, it wasn't a challenge. The human in the loop took more time naturally, uh, but that's not always the case. You'll find the number of AI transactions can be variable in their performance, Gen AI specifically. And so the recommendation here is just understand the workload that you have. You can use simulation to model out how you process through that workload and factor in response time, performance time of your AI. Understand where it needs to perform on each transaction or on average before you go into a program and make assumptions on, on workload capacity based on the performance of your AI engine. Next, we show how AI can't learn every scenario. It's got limitations on data. Um, you and I can watch a YouTube video. Um, if it's in a language that we can speak, we can pick up and learn a new concept within minutes. We assume AI learning is the way that you and I do learning, but in reality, AI learning often is a much narrower band. We also saw how data permutations or deviations that you and I can see and process quickly can turn out to be challenges for AI. In fact, be a whole new concepts that are outside of a data set, a context window of, of data that it's been trained on and it just cannot um, compute those. Next, when we look at the value of an AI system, it's a matrix of cost, speed, accuracy, and confidence. We've talked a lot about cost and speed. Accuracy, in our case, was a very black and white STP rate. Either it could handle the document, could process it, or it couldn't. 92% STP means 92% accuracy. But the other benefit of value we have within our program is a confidence. We had 100% confidence that if that data um, could be handled by AI that it was. If it wasn't, it would be kicked over to the human in the loop. There was 100% agreement between the AI engine and the human in the loop that the, the data exceeded the capabilities for the engine to process, so it confidently would send it to the human in the loop to be processed. Our, an IDP scenario is a very black and white um, type of program, and our engine was able to, in all cases, identify whether it could handle that data or not. There are scenarios where confidence is less, um, specifically in generative AI type scenarios. You may have a case where AI will generate an answer and I'll put, it will get it wrong. It does not know it got it wrong and it actually cannot be trained out of that incorrect answer. When you have those cases, you have a lack of confidence and that confidence number is less than 100. You also have, in essence, a bug in your system that can't be patched easily or maybe at all without a complete retrain or even deploying a new engine or a model. So be aware of that confidence in the output with uh, aligned with your accuracy. Um, you know, next, we saw the importance of mapping your capabilities in terms of business architecture first. This is a great tool to get your entire team aligned around what your capabilities as an organization are that AI is supposed to help with. And then also those heat maps align all of your views on where you're performing to expected measures and standards and where you aren't. Business architecture is your tool to get your entire program mapped out and modeled to build that catalog of things that you can change without necessarily quantifying them yet. The next one is BPMN. BPMN is the first step in order to quantify all of the changes that you can make and what the impact will be from those. I'm a huge proponent and fan of BPMN. I've been using it personally and professionally for over 25 years, not just process modeling for the visual to get all of that data into one graphical representation, but more specifically a BPMN model, which has the structured data of work time, cycle time, transaction cost, wait time, all the parameters that are necessary to do intelligent modeling off of that data artifact to get real results from simulation. So use BPMN as a tool. And then finally, use technology to simulate the impact. Simulation is, I just illustrated your business crystal ball. It shows you all the changes that you could make and the financial or mechanical impact that those changes will have without lifting a finger on the keyboard, without spending a dime on um, outside technology changes or, or process improvements that may or may not make an impact. Um, software engineers are expensive. 
data prompt engineers are expensive, AI license models are very expensive. Before you make a change to any one of those parameters, use simulation as your tool to understand the impact of those. Um, I use Business Compass, which is a great platform that gives you those simulation outputs. So that's it. Those are my um, tips. I want to leave you with this quote. Uh, it's a quote about business that I think um, hits at a lot of the underlying financial themes um, and business themes uh, that we've seen today. I'll just you know, leave you with you know, the notion that these ideas for AI are everywhere. There are great opportunities to improve your business, um, to make workers happier, to make them more productive. Uh, if you get the business case right. Um, our jobs as practitioners with these business cases is to separate out the poor performing, the good performing, the excellent performing business performance from each of these AI programs. Um, I get a chance to work with our clients every day and Business Compass to measure, simulate, um, and recommend changes to their programs and their business, some around AI and others and i hope i get a chance to work with you on the same if you have any questions about this presentation do reach out connect with me um, at salient and i hope to talk to you and work with you going forward thank you goodbye